All right, let's switch tracks a bit, and I want to talk to you for a couple of minutes about the history of human-computer interaction, how we got to where we are today. All right, in prehistoric times, the 1940s, um, this is at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, where I uh, went, went to college. ENIAC, um, one of the first computers, the user interface was a room full of patch cords and, um, and knobs and uh, relays. All right, that doesn't look anything like the computers we use today. In fact, here's a photo of the first mouse ever built. This was done by Doug Engelbart and Bill English at Stanford Research International in uh, Menlo Park, right here in the Bay Area. Doug Engelbart is actually, was a Berkeley graduate student, and up until recently, he would still regularly uh, visit campus. So this mouse uh, is a little bit different from what you, see t uh, what you find today in a mouse. M most of the mice today are optical. They have an optical sensor, basically a small camera on the un underside. This mouse was electromechanical. There are two wheels, one in the x direction, one in the y direction. And when you move the mouse in the y direction, up the table, the y wheel would track and the x wheel would scrape. And you, if you moved it in the x direction, the x wheel would track and the y wheel, y wheel would scrape. Um, here's a view of the bottom just to, to see those two wheels. And basically, these wheels would then uh, drive shaft encoders that would just relay a signal back to a computer how many units the wheel moved in one direction versus the other. Well, it turns out pen input was actually invented right around the same time as the mouse. Right, Ivan Sutherland, um, who also had an office in Soda Hall right here at, at UC Berkeley, um, did this work as his uh, doctoral dissertation at MIT and Lincoln Labs back in the early 1960s. So I'm just going to show you a quick video of Sketchpad in action. From the very first movie of uh, Sketchpad taken in the summer of 1962. So this is 25 years old. This should Remember look Dan's familiar to you, him. right? Look at what he's doing. He's pointing at the edges and saying, I want them to be all mutually perpendicular. And Sketchpad just figured out how to do that. Sketchpad is the first system to ever have a window. He's actually drawing on a virtual sheet of paper about a third of a mile on a side. All right, let's, uh, let's stop it right there since um, you've seen this and this video is also very easily findable online. So what is really, really inspirational here that within the scope of a single PhD dissertation, Ivan Sutherland basically had the vision for the entire CAD industry and for half the product line that Adobe now sells, right? So there, there is um, drawing with a pen. There is constraint satisfaction. So if you're not quite precise, well, an algorithm takes over and makes sides parallel and makes shapes fit. There's panning across uh, infinite windows. Really inspirational. Um, actually, it turns out one of these design choices is one that we don't see much of these days, and that's the input device. The input device from Ivan Sutherland was um, the light pen, and the light pen was a pen with a wire that you would just hold up to a vertical uh, CRT, a cathode ray tube, one of the big deep screens. It turns out the light pen has one really big problem. Can anyone guess what that problem is? Ah, so there's a question of accuracy. So back then, the light pen actually had a little light sensor in the front, and it would detect when the cathode ray tube would scan by its beam, and then it would say, now, and then would figure out, it would synchronize that signal with the screen updating logic and figure out the XY coordinate. So because that was really close by, um, it was reasonably accurate. Yes, we don't use them anymore, but why? <laughs> yes. The cost. So back then, these were really expensive. Um, economies of scale, you could probably make one of these today for about 10 bucks. That is, that is a great reason. Yes, we don't use these types of screens anymore. 
But it turns out there's a non-technical reason why people don't use the light pen. It's not heavy by itself, but it turns out your arm is pretty heavy, and that is exactly the reason. <laughs> Trying to hold a pen up to a vertical screen for any amount of time gives you a really nice sore arm the next day. And so basically, no one really wants to use a light pen for more than 10, 15 minutes at a time. So nowadays, we uh, have shifted to tablets and other horizontal surfaces where it's easy to rest your arm while drawing. And that makes a world of a difference. So it just tells you sometimes the reasons why technologies don't succeed have nothing to do with how ready the technology is. They have everything to do with the human factors around it. All right, after the light pen, um, in the 70s and 80s, we then had the age of personal computing. The killer applications were word processing and spreadsheets. And everyone wanted to have a beige box on their desk. And nowadays, this seems kind of trite, because of course everyone has a desktop. But back then, computers were mainframes that, you know, if you asked really nicely, you would get half an hour of time in the middle of the night. And so the idea of having a computer that belonged solely for you, to you, for your own tasks, um, was revolutionary at the time. Fast forwarding, you may have heard there was a small announcement earlier on today. Arguably, we've now moved beyond the age where personal computing is the dominant paradigm. And I just want to show you two quick precursors um, to tablet and mobile computing. Back in 1985, NASA sent one of the first laptops into space. This was called the grid pad. It cost about $10,000 back then in 1985 dollars. Um, but it was, it was a quantum step about anything that had come before, because it had this clamshell design, which we now still have in our laptops. And it was small enough that you could easily carry it. This was not touch sensitive. However, it didn't take long from the grid pad till we were at a stage where you could go out into a store and buy a phone that had a touch screen that did email um, and also ran games and other applications. And the first phone that did that was the IBM Simon sold in 1992. I don't think anyone in this room has ever used one. Um, I've never seen a real one. I don't know, Dan, if you ever had the chance. <laughs> what the IBM Simon illustrates is actually a really interesting um, general observation about what user interfaces succeed and fail in the marketplace. Oftentimes, the first iteration has all of the features, but fails miserably because the rest of the world isn't quite ready yet for it. And then 10 years later, someone picks up the same ideas, but by now the technology is affordable enough, um, it fits into people's lives uh, better, and then it takes off. Now, what is exciting about working as a researcher in human-computer interaction is that we get to play with the technologies at the IBM Simon stage and earlier. So in our labs, we get to play with the technologies that, you know, 10 years from now, you can buy at the Apple store. All right. Uh, if you're interested in history, um, this is going to be a slide that's going to be online. I have a whole timeline of early um, user interface kind of landmark events, both in software and hardware, that, that you can look at. So what has changed from this age of uh, personal computing? Um, what, what are the research directions that we look at today? Well, here's a quote from Gordon Moore. Does anyone know who Gordon Moore is? I heard mumbling. <laughs> All right, who's reasonably certain about who Gordon Moore is? Yes, co-founder of Intel. All right. So for every ant in the world today, there are 100 transistors. That was in 2003. There are way more than 100 transistors for every ant in the world today. Um, and you could graph this. So 
these aren't accurate numbers. This is just my rough back of the envelope calculation. Back in the 1960s, when the mouse and uh, the light pen were invented, we had many people per processor. And then in the 80s and 90s, when personal computing came along, we had about one processor per person sitting in that beige box on your desk. And now we've really uh, taken off into this age of what's, uh, what has been called ubiquitous computing, where we have hundreds, thousands, millions of processors per person at our disposal. And you can see these different areas uh, find expression in different types of HCI research. So in the early days, uh, mainframe computing, it was all about human factors. How do we make an efficient interface so one person can get their task done quickly and then let the next person use the mainframe? Um, personal computing, uh, the edge of personal computing was very much concerned with psychology and cognitive science, understanding how the dialogue between one person and one computer happens. Now that we're in the age of ubiquitous computing, um, there's much more of a focus on what happens when computers don't look like desktop computers and what happens when we use computers to collaborate with each other. 